without you, we have nothing without you, and without everything that we give, everything that we do, it's all because of what you've done already done for us. So, we thank you for all these things in So today is Easter, it's Resurrection Sunday, we'll remember uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and I want to do something that's a little bit um, different today, I do a little bit different type of sermon than normally what I'm used to giving. Um, and, and first, I just want to talk about where we are in society uh, in America. So, just to give you guys a, a, a kind of like a, a brief history of Christianity in America, uh, America was founded on Christian values, supposedly, right? And, and, and you know, they, we butchered that over time, right? Because I don't really think any country that had slavery can really be say that they were firmly founded on Christian values. But, I mean, the, at least, at the very least, we were teaching and, and kind of raising people up with these values within our schools, within the churches, within uh, social contexts. So back then, for a long period of time, um, people really didn't question faith too much. It was just kind of a, a given thing. And when people would go to church, it was just kind of a given thing. When, so when preachers would preach about the gospel and preach about the resurrection and preach about Jesus Christ, all of these things were kind of just a given thing, right? And people's faith was just kind of a given thing. And then he switched over to an era called uh, the period of modernism. And the period of modernism was, was uh, very different than what was going on before. The period of modernism was all about rational thought. It was about rational thought, it was about questioning, and, and, the, and the question was no longer from just believing in Jesus Christ to whether we have good reason to believe in Jesus Christ. That became the question when we went into the period of modernism. And that was met with hostility from the Christian church. But you know, when I look back in retrospect, I'm not sure if that necessarily was like the worst thing in the world. Right? And then we, we moved on to the era that we're in now called postmodernism, which is really stupid. I mean, we just in a terrible, stupid era of postmodernism. And I'll explain to you why it's dumb. Because postmodernism is all about subjectivity. And it's about the fact that everybody's, everything's subjective. Beliefs are subjective, whatever you believe is subjective, whatever you hold dear in your heart is subjective, because they're really, everybody's just entitled equally to kind of have a basis of believing whatever you want to believe. And that's kind of in the era that we're in now, postmodernism. So if everybody wants to believe whatever they want to believe, you have an equal basis for believing that. And I mean, I'll give you, I mean, if I was to come up here and try to convince you guys that I'm God, if I came up here and said, I am God, right, and someone was to object and say, whoa, 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 wait a second. I have an equal basis to believe that I'm God as you, you have to believe whatever you believe, right? I hope somebody would smack me across the face. Because I have no faith. That, that's ridiculous, right? It's ridiculous. If you get to if you know me, you know that that's utterly ridiculous, right? There's zero chance of that being true. And, and you know, that, that's ridiculous. So I think we need to go back a step because I think the better question, and rather everybody just kind of feel free to believe whatever they want to believe and have equal basis for believing it, is whether we have good reason to believe the things we believe. Whether we have good reason to believe in Christianity. I think that's actually the better question, and I don't have a lot of time today, because you know, we have a time restriction on the service, so normally I do these things over like a three-hour seminar, but I actually want to kind of just go over some of the things that... Um, then, you know, I've processed through, I've learned, and I've researched, and, and done, and throughout the years, and kind of understanding this question of, why should we believe in Christianity? So, I just want to start off by saying that um, the claims Jesus Christ made in the first, uh, during that time period where, where he was walking this earth, were some really bold claims. And these were documented in, in four books called the Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had, it was dated by both his, uh, historians, Christian and non-Christian alike, are dated about 30 to 40 years after the death of Jesus Christ. Right? That's, that's around the time they gave these books. And these books had extremely extravagant claims, right? They, they claim very strong things. Now, if you want to actually talk about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one thing to remember, or one thing to kind of uh, understand stylistically the way that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was written was that it was written in historical form rather than narrative form. So to give you guys an um, understanding of what I'm talking about, historical form says that it's kind of just written in, in, a, in, a, in a very historical type of eyewitness or kind of investigative type of way, stylistically, versus narrative form which is written as storytelling, as if you're going to tell a story. So I'll give you an example. Um, 
My son's favorite movie currently is Finding Nemo. Right? He loves Finding Nemo. He's obsessed with Finding Nemo. He wants to watch Finding Nemo all the time. And his favorite movie is Finding Nemo. Now, in Finding Nemo, there's a scene where Nemo's father, Marlin, is looking for Nemo. And when Nemo's father, Marlin, is looking for Nemo, ne Marlin goes with this other fish called Dory, who has short-term memory loss, on this kind of journey to find Nemo. And as they're kind of looking for Nemo, uh, there's a scene where they run across a whole bunch of fish. And the fish talk to them, and, and they're kind of asking the fish for directions. And as Marlin leaves, uh, as yeah, Marlin leaves, Dory, the one with short-term memory, is talking to these fish, and the fish go, hey, by the way, remember one thing. When you come across a trench, go through it, not over it. Right? Now, when you're watching this movie, you automatically know that this is going to come into play later on in the story, right? Like, you know that. Right? There's no reason for them to put this scene in there if this is not going to come into play later on in the story. You know that the trench is going to come out sometime throughout the movie, and you know that Dory's short-term memory loss is going to play a factor in that. You're taking a mental note of that, right? That's the way we do things when we tell a story in narrative form. We don't help things for no reason whatsoever, and especially stylistically, back then, that never happened. People never told stories in that fashion or in that manner, right? But, when you look at the stories of Jesus Christ, they're written in this manner where things would happen and we have absolutely no idea why it's happening. There's no explanation as to what's going on. Um, one of the, I'll give you a quick example. There's a story about uh, an adulterous woman about to be stoned. And in, in, that, in that story, before the about stoner, Jesus Christ is there, and, and he, he starts writing in the sand with his finger. And then, you know, he says a famous phrase, which is, he who has uh, no city has first stone, right? But the question is, why? What is he writing in the sand? And I've heard a lot of stories, I've heard a lot of sermons as to what he's writing at for a lot of people, but they're all guesses. It's a fact that matters, we don't know, right? We don't know what Jesus Christ is writing in the sense. So why would the Bible say something like that? Why would the Bible put there if there really is no purpose as to what's going on, where there's no explanation as to what he's writing in the sense? Well, because it's written in historical form. Which means that somebody was either documenting this or it was through an eyewitness account itself about what's going on. And when you do that, there's stuff that's in there that really has no purpose to the story or really an explanation as to what's going on. And so, stylistically, that's the way that it was written. Now, these four Gospels, like I mentioned before, have extraordinary claims, extremely broad, I mean, bold claims, right? They say that this guy claims to be the Son of God. That's what he claims to be. He claims to be the Son of God, and that he's convinced many people that he is the Son of God. So, for example, some of the bold claims that they make in, in, in the four Gospels, which is only 34 years after the death of Jesus Christ, is that he... <laughs> turn water into wine, right? That's a claim that he makes. Now, back then, when, when, when you talk about turning water into wine in this concept of a wedding, weddings, you know, today, we, we think about a big wedding, it's like four or five hundred people, that's a big wedding, right? But back then, weddings were even bigger than that. Weddings, the entire town comes together. So it's an entire town coming together to witness this. Now, this is an extremely bold claim for them to say that this guy turned water into wine at a wedding where the entire town is there to see that or to witness that. That is an extremely bold claim to make 30 or 40 years after it happens to say something like that if it really has no validity to it whatsoever. Another example, he says that he's 500 people. He fed 500 people with a few loaves of bread and fish. Uh, five, sorry, 5,000 people, 5,000 people. Now that is an extremely bold claim to make to say 5,000 people were fed with a few loaves of bread and fish and 5,000 people were there to witness this and see this and experience this. Like, how dumb would you have to be to make a claim like that and if it has absolutely no validity to it whatsoever, right? Um, other claims, you see that he, he raised a man, Lazarus, from the dead. And once again, there were people that witnessed this. There are people that actually experience this. These are extremely bold claims, but perhaps the boldest, but the boldest claim that is made and is often used as the evidence of the fact that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, is the resurrection story. Now, many religions and people can, can actually concede that Jesus Christ is an extraordinary being. 
Right? They, they, they could have seen that. I mean, there's, there's no way that this first century church movement could have happened. There's no way that, that all these people could have just been on board with this guy if there was like no validity. So they, many could, could kind of conceive that this guy was an extraordinary person. Um, you know, for example, in the Jewish religion, he's seen as an extraordinary teacher. Someone who, who draws people towards a very charismatic leader. Um, in the um, Muslim religion, he's believed that to be a great prophet. Right? And in Hindu religion, he's believed to be one of many different gods, right? But none of the religions actually say that he is who he claimed he was. And when while he was walking the earth, right? None of them actually confirm about who he actually claimed he was. Now, in confirming about who he actually claimed he was, the biggest story and the biggest account is the resurrection story. And this is the one that a lot of people outside of Christianity contend, and they, they make different various claims regarding this. So, I actually want to talk briefly about the epistles. Now, the epistles were letters that were written in the first century church, and most of them were dated from 20 to 50 years after Jesus Christ's death. And the one that we're going to look at in 1 Corinthians was, was dated about roughly 20 years after Jesus Christ's death, and it says, after that, he, meaning Jesus Christ, appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time most of whom are still living. Now this is written only 20 years, roughly about 20 years after Jesus Christ's death, and what they're saying in this is that they're claiming that 500 people saw this guy, and they're still living today. You can go ahead and ask them, because they're still around during this time period. Now 20 years is really not that long, so I'll give you an example. Let's say, for example, um, 20 years ago when I was still a teenager, I said that Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player that ever lived, right? In his prime, in the late 90s, when he was winning championships, came to Bayside, Queens. And I challenged Michael Jordan to a one-on-one -on -one basketball match, right? And I'm up here telling you this is true. I challenged Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player that ever lived, to a one-on-one -on -one basketball match. And we went outside, and we went to the playground nearby, and we played, and 500 people saw me destroy Michael Jordan on the playground. You would look at me and you would say, you're an idiot. You would look at me and say, that, that can't possibly be true. Like, where is the proof about this? But that, that's ridiculous for you. You would discount me as crazy immediately. Here's a guy writing a letter, and in the letter he says, 20 years after Jesus Christ resurrects, he says he appears to more than 500 people. And you know what? Check it out if you don't believe it. Ask them, most of them are still living. Most of them are still around. If there's no basis to this whatsoever, people will look at me and think, you're crazy. This is, this is ridiculous. You're just talking nonsense. See, see, the claims that are made are so bold and so extravagant. In fact, let's just talk about Christian history for, for by itself. Let, let, let's not, if, you, if you're not convinced by the documents, let's talk about Christian history by itself. When Christian history happened in the first century, it exploded like no other religion at the time. Right? It, 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 it flew like a wildfire. There was, there was things that was happening that has never happened before in the history. For example, you had races that hated each other historically, Jews and Gentiles, that where, where Jews looked at Gentiles like they were filthy, that they were contaminated people, and all of a sudden, what is it? They're having meals together, and, and they're distributing their belongings, pulling their belongings, and distributing to the poor. You have Jews that are being intentional about going to these people into areas like Antioch, where they are at, to specifically minister to people that historically and culturally they wanted nothing to do with. That it was taboo to even be around. Historically, that's actually what happened. And it was such it was almost at such a, a, a quick turning point that this happened. That actually, um, I don't remember who, who, who actually quoted this. Um, I, I, I found this quote somewhere, but I actually don't know. It, it was a professor, but if you just put it up there, sorry, I don't remember who quoted it. But this is actually what it says, and this quote really um, caught my attention. But this is the quote that it says It says, If you don't believe in the resurrection, then you still have to believe that something amazing happened to the disciples of a different kind, but of equal force with its electrifying intensity. If we try to explain the changed lives of the early Christians, we may find ourselves making leaps of faith 
as great as if we believed in the resurrection itself. That, that's crazy. So basically what he's saying is that, hey, if you're denying the resurrection, and, and you're, you're, you're kind of dismissing the resurrection, then you actually have to have faith, or you actually have to have belief, that something happened that had equal force to the resurrection. That was all that magnitude, that was all that miraculous magnitude to the resurrection itself. That's what he's saying. That's how, that's how powerful and how ridiculous and irrational the first century church movement was when it actually took place. Now, I actually want to actually read a passage that talks about the resurrection in itself. If we go to the passage, this is in the book of John. And this is a passage that actually talks about the resurrection in itself, and it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, and said, yeah. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now, let's stay with this for a second. Um, Within the four gospel women, when they talk about the resurrection story, right? Um, all that have Mary in it, or they have women in it, right? It's, it's about Mary, or it's about women that were with Mary, and that's how they have the first accounts of the resurrection. That's how they have the first accounts of the eyewitnesses that, that went to see the tomb. That was them. I'm going to say we're in a very unique time period in history. We are in an extremely unique time period in history because we can actually look back to this and see this as evidence of the resurrection. I'll tell you why. <laughs> All right, so back then, it was an extremely patriarchal, I mean, extremely patriarchal sexist society. That's the way that it was back then. So women back then, during that time period, right, they were not seen as credible witnesses. In fact, women, you know, they were, they were often dismissed. You needed at least a bunch of women to actually witness to something together, to equal the weight of just one man witnessing it. That's how society viewed women. Women were extremely oppressed, it was a very sexist, patriarchal society, and people didn't really take the eyewitness testimonies of women seriously. That's how it was back in those days. Now, that doesn't mean anything to us today, right? That doesn't mean anything to us today, right? But if we look at this, and what actually happened and transpired in the first century historically, when, when this story came out, and when similar stories like this came out about women being the first to go over and view the tomb, when Mary Magdalene was one of the first to go and view the tomb, when those stories came out, when those stories were documented, we have historical evidence that rulers of the time period, great philosophers, leaders, and, and religious leaders, took that as evidence to use against Christianity. That was one of the primary evidences that was used against the resurrection story. That when they, when they saw this, and when they, when they heard about this, and when they read this, we have actual evidence of documents where they say, wait a second, how can we take this seriously if it's women that are being documented as the first to witness this? That we are in an extremely, extremely, um, I actually would say privileged time period, because we can actually stand I can actually stand here, you can actually sit there, and you can actually process this, and you look at this and you say, who in their right mind would make up a story where, where the, the, the evidence, the, the primary evidence that you're trying to use, one of the primary evidence that you're trying to use, is going to be automatically discounted within that time period? Who would possibly make up a story like that? You would have to be crazy, right, to make up a story where where the primary evidence is going to be used against you. So we're actually in an extraordinary time period where we can look back we can look back today and look back to that time period and say, well, that is strong evidence that historically it happened that way because there's no way that somebody would write down that it happened that way if it didn't actually happen that way. <laughs> you know, I think about Mary Magdalene. We don't know a ton about Mary, but what we do know about her is a little bit disturbing. It's a little bit disturbing. Um, Mary, it says at one point, had seven demons in her. So she was somebody that people thought at one point, people were just like, she's crazy. And that, that's actually what people thought about Mary. They thought she was crazy. She wasn't a leader. She wasn't a special woman. She wasn't a, a pillar of society. She wasn't a great member, a contributing member in any way whatsoever. She wasn't a member of an elite household. They looked at her and she was like, she's a woman that was crazy. 
<laughs> she once had seven demons in her and was cast out of her. I mean, if you want to talk about somebody who well, back then they looked at had no credibility. And yet she is the first witness of the resurrection. And this person who is deeply oppressed as a woman, who has been discounted all of her life, who is seen as weak, who is seen as nothing, she is the first person documented to go and witness the resurrection. You know, I, 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 I'm actually, um, I told my wife, Jamie, that today, or sometime in the future, uh, I'm going to confess one of my sins. Because I did something really bad, um, really dumb. And basically, I actually spent the last eight days kind of losing sleep over it. You know, it bothered me so much, it bothered me to that point. Um, so I'll just tell you guys, share with you guys what it was. <clears throat> so, not this past Saturday, the Saturday before that, my in-laws came up. Um, and my in-laws came up from Virginia and Maryland, and uh, we decided to all go eat together at a restaurant. And we went to this restaurant, and um, they told us to wait 10 minutes. It's going to be 10 minutes. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, I see how packed the restaurant is. So I'm kind of thinking, it's not going to be 10 minutes. It's going to be longer than that. So I was like, oh, let's just leave. Let's find another place. And, and you know, my wife was like, no, 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 we'll stick around. You know, we'll just kind of wait to see, you know, this week, by the time we get somewhere else, it might, might be like too late anyway. We waited. And, and during that time period, we were already extremely hungry. It was like 8 o'clock when we started waiting. They told us 10 minutes. Uh, we were waiting. and. It eventually um, went on to like 9 15. So we were waiting there an hour 15 minutes. <laughs> so funny, everyone gasped. Like, first, first world problems. <laughs> <laughs> no! Hour 15! <laughs> How are you still alive? <laughs> was not expecting that. Thank you for your sympathy. <laughs> so. I'm waiting out 15 minutes, and, um, and, and during that time period, I'm extremely hungry, you know, the kids are, the bunch of kids that are with, they're running wild, and I'm like, and I'm just getting very, very frustrated. And so, um, there's a man, I don't know what his role was in the restaurant, I don't know if he's the manager, I don't know if he's the owner, but um, basically, we were at Party of Eleven, and right before we were about to be seated, another, another Party of Eleven came right before us, and they were like, oh, we have reservations. So as soon as we saw the, party, the big party leave, we thought that was us. And they're like, oh, sorry, we have to take you know, this, this, this family, I mean, this group first because they had reservations, right? And I was looking at that, and I was, I was, um, I think what really upset me was the fact that they told us that it was going to be 10 minutes, and we ended up waiting an hour 15. I was like, thinking, like, during that time period, we could have been somewhere, eat, somewhere else eating, right? Had you just kind of been up front with us since the beginning, and had you known about this reservation? All this stuff. So I, I got extremely upset. And I just kind of yelled, lashed out everything to this one man. I, I, I went nuts, you know. I, I didn't, I mean, there were kids around, so I didn't use any square words, but I kind of went nuts. And I was just screaming at him, like, just yelling at him, like, you told us it was, it was an hour. And you told us it took minutes, hour 15. <laughs> what is your problem? I mean, honestly, I, I can honestly say, had someone videotaped that, then I would be on YouTube today. <laughs> I was screaming my head off like a man, man, like, how dare you lie to us, you know, I was just going crazy, and, um, you know, and what I, what I kind of realized, um, I mean, what kind of bothered me was, like, it wasn't this man who told us it was going to be 10 minutes, right, he wasn't the one who did it, he was just a guy who was kind of speeding people, right, so he wasn't even the culprit, like, he wasn't even, like, he was just a guy doing his job, right, and as I was going home, um, I was really reflecting on that. I reflected on this like that night. Uh, it bothered me so much. And here's why it bothered me so much. Normally, uh, <laughs> those of you who are like friends with me know that that happens once in a while. Um, <laughs> but normally, when that happens, it's it's like I feel like it's 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 a bully, and and that bully deserves to be like bullied. I don't know if that makes sense, right? So normally when that happens, like, I feel like it's a guy who's like a tough guy who just kind of needs to be set in his place or, or you know, whatever. I mean, like, that normally that's kind of what thought process is going through my mind. And so normally, you know, I would kind of feel bad about it, ashamed about it because, you know, I'm a pastor. But, I mean, this time I just I felt horrible. 
I felt horrible to the point where it bothered me for the last eight days that I was. I mean, that night I had very, I had really difficulty sleeping. You know, I, I must have been up for about three hours just kind of thinking about it. And here's why I had such difficulty. Because I've told you guys in a testimony before that among my group of friends, I'm known as the guy who's like always on bully patrol. Right? I'm always like, good morning, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> good morning you know? like, I'm always that guy who's like on bully patrol. And, you know, for the first time, um, since in about like, maybe like six years, six, seven years, a thought came into my head, which is that this man is going to go home and he's going to talk about me. You know, and for me to process something like that was extremely difficult. I, I mean, it was, it was extremely difficult. You know, I felt so ashamed. You know, I felt so sad. You know, I reflected on my heart a lot. And it was to the point where, you know, I started kind of even saying, maybe I shouldn't be a pastor. You know, maybe these people like this just shouldn't be a pastor, right? Like, what if somebody saw that? What if somebody witnessed something like that? And um, if I was to be completely honest, I, I probably, I might even probably take it to another step, which is that I had a moment of it in my mind where I was like, maybe I shouldn't even be a Christian. If I'm going to act like that. Maybe I'm going to be a pastor. Maybe I shouldn't be a Christian. Christians shouldn't even act like that. And during that time, I felt so low. I felt like nothing during my time of repentance, during my time of you know, going through this process. I felt so low. I felt like nothing. I felt so weak. I felt so inadequate. I felt so unworthy. And then I was kind of processing through this sermon, and something really dawned on me. Who was Mary Magdalene? Who is the first person that we have that's documented the evidence of the resurrection? Who is this person that was used so heavily in the kingdom of God? She is a person that people look at in society and they say she is low, she is weak, she's not a contributor, she can't do anything. And that is who is used in the story, the grand story, the grand finale of Jesus Christ. You know, I think Christians need to do such a Horrible job in misrepresenting Christianity. Today, Christians, who, 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 are, who are the people that go to church? We think about when we think about Christians, we think about the bottom down, moralistic, self righteous people who have everything together. That's kind of our image in our head when we think about Christians the people who have everything together. And the people who kind of frown upon and look down upon and kind of look at people who are broken, who are weak, the marginalized of society, and we say, you know what? Why don't you change first before you can kind of join us? And yet, this is proof that that is not the resurrection story. That's not what it was about. See, a lot of times we look at the resurrection story and we forget why it's good news. Why is the resurrection story good news? Because Jesus Christ came for the half. The people who have things, the, the privileged, the ones who, who are kind of in the seat where they just kind of have the button down, uh, moralistic look, and they can look at down on other people. Is that who Jesus Christ came for? Is that why it's the news? No, the reason why it's the gospel, which is the good news, the resurrection story is truly good news, is because it's for people like Mary Magdalene, who was oppressed by society, who was looked down by, uh, by society, who probably even felt alone at times. It's for people like that. You see, Jesus Christ is the champion of the oppressed. He's the champion of those who feel alone. He's the champion of those who feel like they're nothing and worthless and don't feel like they deserve grace, but yet he still shows it to them. The gospel is good news, and, and, and we have to step out to reach it. We have to step out to accept it. That is all we really have to do because it is given to us freely. But here's the thing that I want to share with you guys. Because I hate to break it to you. Because yes, the gospel is good news. Yes, we have to go out and believe in it. Yes, that is the step that we have to take. But there is one exception. There is one rule to all of this. You have to believe that you are weak. You have to believe that you are nothing. And only the message of the gospel, only something as beautiful as Jesus Christ dying for us and resurrecting, and possibly, possibly place us in the glorious stand in the inheritance of God. Mm. Let's go to him in prayer. <coughs> and I'm going to ask the worship team to come up.
And today I want to ask you this. Is the gospel good news? Now, you might be sitting in two different types of seats today. You might be sitting in the seat that tells you, I'm okay. I'm okay because I have 